Howie, welcome back. How are you? Good. Good to see you. Yeah, likewise. Yeah, so, and we're getting to the place now where it's going to be in person increasingly. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I'm vaccinated. I'm really rock and roll. So it's, uh, it's been, it's been a rough ride, but I think people are emerging from hibernation, and it's, uh, and it feels good to see it. So. Yeah, we're getting our second shots on Tuesday. So cool. Really ready to return to civilization. Lovely. Yeah, it's only so long that you can spend in the loincloth, you know, throwing bits of food at people and stuff. We definitely have to get civilized again. <laughs> I've, I've started wearing uh, Mia's old bathrobe around the house. I, like, <laughs> I, like I might as well just embrace how, how unsocial I am. Have you started throwing things at kids on your lawn and just stuff like that yet? Or not? <laughs> I, I ordered <laughs> kettlebells from Amazon and... and um, heavier than I'm using. And the workout this morning was so bad that I really had this fantasy, like having a double barrel shotgun in my, in my driveway and just telling the Amazon driver, like I've changed my mind. <laughs> I'm sure they get that all the time. They're probably like, yeah, completely <laughs> attenuated to it. Like oh, another guy with a shotgun. <laughs> cool. So, um, so today um, we, we've had a bit of an interesting exchange via text and things about some forwards, um, partly because you were, you're reading an interesting book about self-talk and we kind of got into a bit of back and forth about the roles of self-talk, both positive, negative, harmful, useful, um, and how far it can take you and where it goes. Um, and I think it's it's an interesting topic. And I want to kind of get, get into this a little bit, both with relevance to your work as a coach um, and somebody who guides people towards healthier lifestyles and better lifestyle choices, and and mine as a coach and a, and a presenter, you know, guiding people towards um, better personal safety and security, understanding themselves, and uh, and in particular, understanding, understanding how stress and fear get in the way of them embodying the things that, and, that they want to do and making the decisions that they want to do. Um, and I have to admit, in the past, I haven't put a lot of truck with the idea of self-talk. It's kind of, it's it's found its way in there somewhere along crystals and, you know, manifesting the world and things like that sometimes, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> where I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah, you talk to yourself in a different way and wonderful things happen. I, so I think I should acknowledge that first up, that um, for, for many, many years, I was biased against the idea that self-talk was even a thing, you know, that it was, that it's not really that important, that we chatter away in our heads, but it's not necessarily positive or negative. And then I think probably a little bit of, an, uh, of a snobbish kind of view of like, well, if you're the sort of person that ruminates all the time and you have like negative self-talk going on, you should just sort yourself out and stop doing that. You know, like it's a really easy thing to do, like to stop. Um, and I think I've come to a bit more of a nuanced understanding, particularly over the last year when we've all had more time for self-talk and rumination <laughs> and, and come to a place that's somewhere in the middle, like, yeah, this is, this is actually quite important and we, and we should, um, we should think about it. Um, but I, I'm still, I'm still kind of not necessarily aligned in my methodologies with, with some of the recommendations that are made in a cognitive way to try and get over these problems. So I'm interested to kind of hash this out a little bit and see, see where you're at. Yeah, it's funny because I come from, you know, the coaching tradition, which is largely based on cognitive approaches, yeah. has, has included more emotional and physiological approaches, but really not, you know, like you and Stephen Porges are my secret weapons as a coach. Mm. You guys, what I learned from you guys is what differentiates me from, because we, like the coaches I learned from, the top coaches in the industry, in the world, the ones who get millions of dollars to work with CEOs of Fortune 5 companies, mm. they're like, you know, their basic view is your beliefs and your environment create the limitations that you have to overcome. Yeah. So, you know, and, and, and they're good at what they do and they yeah. get results. What what I came to real and I don't and I don't disagree with them at all. Sure, there's a definite kernel of truth in that, right? Yeah, I mean, I think it's more than a kernel of truth. I think, it, yeah. I think there is an entire truth in that whole but, XL sized thing of popcorn of, of truth. In <laughs> <laughs> Butter. What, <laughs> what, what they're missing is, I think, that the the cognitive stuff is a meta phenomenon. It's. Mm it's not always the thing that you can change. It's almost yeah. like saying, okay, your, your business is struggling. What you've got to do is make more money. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> great. Now what do we do? Yeah. You know, well, sell more. Yeah. <laughs> Raise your prices. Sell to people more often, right? Mm. <laughs> yeah. stuff, so what, but what, what are, you know, then we get down to, okay, well, what are the behaviors that you yeah. have to do? I got to make more webinars 
I have to write more blog posts. I have to network with people more, all these. Okay, now what's getting in the way of that? Hmm. I don't like doing it. I don't yeah. think promoting my, right? <laughs> so, 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 you're, so you kind of send the thing that actually solves the problem is not talking about it differently to yourself. It's actually taking actions, identifying the actions you need to take. And then that sorts out the self-talk to an extent. Or? Not necessarily. I feel like hmm. I can still, like I, I have been teaching my, my students and clients some of the self-talk stuff that I got from this book, which is called Chatter by Ethan Cross. Yeah. Um, which it's like, the you know what we what you and I learned about stress when we learned about stress was that you need to calm down right to, hmm. to think different things like mm -hmm. so count to ten when you're angry or ask yourself certain questions and what we know is that when we're under stress the part of the brain that knows how to do that is basically locked in the trunk yeah hmm. so it's like you know if you want to drive well. You get the driver out of the trunk and put it in the driver's seat, but then it still has to drive. So sure. I think self-talk can still be useful, but you can't do it hmm. unless you deal with the stuff that you teach, unless you deal with the physiology, with the neurology. Okay, so let's let's backtrack a little bit and just kind of define what we mean by self-talk, right? So let's acknowledge that we all, to a greater or lesser extent, have this voice in our heads, right? This little voice that talks to us and one of the goals that seems of like meditation or awareness and mindfulness practices and things like that is to become more aware of this voice being there, right? So it's for some people, it's so omnipresent that we don't even notice it, right? And it's only when you sit still and try and be quiet and try not try not to things, not not to think things, but try to just sit still and and watch yourself that you watch this conversation playing out and you realize that it's extraordinarily difficult not to have thoughts about things, right? The, the not to have some verbiage going on in there, right? Um, so there's definitely a voice that emerges that goes there, dig, 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 right? But there's, when you look at the kind of like the, the neuroscience of this and the psychology of it, it's not clear that self-talk is what we think it is, right? That it's not, we're not making coherent sentences that make meaning of the world with our self-talk. And then we say that to ourselves and then we're surprised by it. And we're like, oh yeah, that's right. And then <laughs> we go on to make decisions. It's, it's often that we're actually, that's the emergent property of the decisions and the connections that we're already making, right? There's, there's things going on in the brain, there's associations, there's comparisons with past memory, there's um, predictions being made, you know, there's, there's assessments from the limbic system, like how scary is this? How angry should this make me? Um, and there's rationalizations that are going on. There's all kinds of things in the big, wonderful soup that is your brain and your thought process is happening. And in the same way that dreams can be emergent from that, right, when you're asleep, Self-talk can be emergent from that, I think, when you're when you're in a waking state, right? Um, I'm not going too deep into states of consciousness just now, but but it's definitely there, isn't it? And and some people notice it more than others. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, you you know much more about this than I do. Um, well, you just read the book on it, so you probably know more than me at this point. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, what I got from the book is that it's a natural part of human. Um, experience and it's sure. not a bad thing like one of one of the things that I realized when I was reading the book is that I kind of got the mindfulness kool-aid that we shouldn't be mm. having self-talk right that it's it's getting in the way of presence yeah yeah and that's the, that's the prevailing kind of live your optimized self Sam Harris be super cool do you know what I mean like if that's that's the thing that's being sold to us it's just like if you were a full fully realized semi-Buddha or something, do you, if you were fully enlightened, then the self-talk just wouldn't happen. You'd be fully present in the moment. You're experiencing everything as it comes and you're not labeling or rationalizing. Um, you're just experiencing the world as maybe like a natural, a natural animal would, right? You just, you're happy about things. You're sad about things. Um, it's not affecting you because of the rumination. And, and the, one of the goals of meditation is it's not the explicit goal but it's kind of it's pushed that way right the, um, that if you get better at meditation there probably should be less chatter it's there's going to be less chatter because you meditate right that's kind of one of the things that's said first you look at it and then over time you it depletes and then you can spend longer and longer periods of focus on something that's not your own thoughts um, and then that's an emergent thing right so that's one of the things that's told to us that self-talk is is either waste matter right that it's just kind of emerging from things like that or it's negative or it's like pathological right you're thinking about it and then you're wrapped up in yourself 
and you're lost in the illusion that you even have a self, right? Some people even say that, like that you mistake the self-talk for your actual, you know, perceiving mind or, or the witness or whatever it is, and that you're identifying with that. And in identifying with those thoughts, you're making a huge mistake and it's really dumb. And if only you were more enlightened, then you wouldn't do that, right? That's, that seems, I'm paraphrasing, but that seems to be one of the things. Yeah, and it's, it's very uh, seductive. And it might be true. Like, I don't know. <laughs> mm. I'm so far from that state. <laughs> but I can't even tell you how far from that state I am. Okay. <laughs> You're on the other end of the self-talk spectrum. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a voice in my head saying, I don't self-talk. Right. Yeah. Do I? Don't. No, I don't. Yes, I do. No, no. <laughs> Pay no attention to the self-talk behind the curtain. Right. So, yeah. So to draw an analogy with martial arts, like the field that I'm experienced in for many years and doing that, there's this concept in, in Japanese martial arts, at least called Mushin. And, and it's, which means no mind in Japanese. Right. Um, and this is the mythical kind of uh, perfect state that you're supposed to be trying to, uh, to attain during a potential conflict, right. That you rather than think or try and predict what's going to happen in this conflict, whether somebody's going to try and attack you or whether somebody's trying to faint to the left and then come the other side or, you know, play dirty tricks or whatever it is. And, and rather than try and predict what you're going to do, like, okay, I think I'm going to grab him around the legs and make him fall over, or I'm going to take the sword and come from the top right. And that's definitely going to get him not planning, but just um, kind of getting that mind out of the way, that higher mind out of the way and allowing the body and it's kind of, attendant processes and experiences to do the work for you right and the idea in in those traditional martial arts is that if you practice something enough if you get enough muscle memory and enough experience in enough ranges of situations that the, the mushin can manifest right you can maintain no mind because you know, you've you've practiced being in that state even in quite complicated things right so and in martial arts i've you know i've worked with people for many many years and seen people attempt to do that like um but i've never outside of like old stories of miyamoto masashi 16th century swordsman and things actually seen somebody do it perfectly right exhibit that characteristic of no mind with possible exception of my instructors in the russian martial art system who seem to be able to do that uh, at extraordinarily high level like they're just everything every movement they make is so spontaneous that it's almost comical it's almost like they can predict where something's going and not only can they move out the way and slap you around the face, but they can make your cup of tea and hand it to you while you've, you know, at the same time, you know, it's, it's, or put a cherry on top by disarming you with their foot and then placing, placing the, your own knife lightly on the back of your head or something like that. Right. It's ridiculously spontaneous. So I'm prepared to believe there is a state in which that happens. Right. Um, and martial arts has been built for a, a long time as a way of achieving that I've experienced snippets of that state but that's not my day-to-day -day state right that's not the state that i exist in all day every day my my waking experience is one of variously reacting to things in which that i know what to do and feel confident about and have resources for um reacting to things poorly when i feel unresourced right and i start to feel tense and i'm like oh I've got to do something about this and i create an urgency in myself and and uh, towards action and getting something done right um or sometimes freezing being like overwhelmed by the input of information and having to stop and take stock. And from that point onwards, one of two things can happen. You can either stop, take stock and be like, okay, uh, clear your mind, breathe, try and let everything settle. And then once things have settled, write down a list or plan of action or try and organize things and then go back about it or get lost in the funnel of rumination and sit there for a good hour and a half, just with things spinning around in your head about how you're never going to solve this problem. Right. So th this is my experience of self-talk is that in a physical capacity, um, I enjoy being able to not have any of it, right. That literally like it goes away and you can just enjoy yourself, not thinking about things right in a practical decision-based world, especially in the information based world where the work happens. Right. And um, it comes in and it comes out. It's not for me. It's not like an, an everyday all day thing that irritates me and annoys me that I have to work against, but it's definitely there. Right. It can rear its ugly head. Is that, um, do you feel like that's a, yeah, that's, that's, real. that's something that's in coaching. Um, it's gone the other way. It's more like an acknowledgement and a focus on the, the periods of talk rather than the periods of, of no mind. Yeah. Well, I think it, it depends on what we're trying to achieve. Mm. And I think it's very, there are so many analogies that, that don't quite convey. Mm. So if you talk, like the different, like, you know, like coaching, the word coaching, most people think of for sports. 
Yeah. And there are analogies between coaching for sports and coaching for business performance or life performance or relationship, but they're not perfect. And I sure. think we, we can get in trouble when we, when we take from one domain to another without examining where, where it falls down. So like, mm. for, you know, so we've both seen Vladimir be miraculous in, yeah. in his no mind movement. You far more than me. I just watched him on videos and went up for a, for a yeah. week. I've been on the receiving end of it, which is the real proof in the pudding <laughs> well, many I, times. I, yeah. I, I mean, I've been hit by, by Vlad, by mm. Martin Wheeler, by yep. um, Kwan Lee, so mm. by you. So I've certainly, you know, experienced like also like just, just to out myself what I've been doing during the pandemic. I've been watching YouTube videos of this guy. I think his name is Apollo Robbins and he's like a pickpocket. Mm. And like, a, you know, he, he does it on stage, but he could certainly make a living doing it on the street. Sure. And, yeah. And, you know, with all these different camera angles and showing exactly what he does. And, mm. and, you know, clearly he breaks it down the same way that Vlad would break it down or, you know, someone would break down sword mechanics. Mm. But you can tell that he's reading the other person, knows how to step in and out of their personal space, knows how to get their eyes to go here or there and does mm. it. So there's something about, just practicing in a domain mm. over and over and over again and, and, um, and working to, to quiet self-talk or to notice self-talk and to allow the body to, to take over. Like I'm, I'm pretty sure that Vlad is not no mind 24 seven. Like he's mm. sitting in his office paying bills and trying to figure out, you know, rental of the space or whatever. Like he's struggling. Yeah like the rest of us, mm. right? So it's not like 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 the, the, the promise of like meditation and yoga and Sam Harris is like, this can become universal. Mm. And, you know, if I were, I imagine if we were like universally no mind, we'd have to wear diapers, right? Like we, we yeah. could like, you know. Yeah, that it, argument's been made many done. Yeah, you don't want like a, a whole nation of people who are just completely present in the moment and then watch people march over their borders and oppress them <laughs> kind of stuff. You, know, you could argue that's probably happened in history, you know, like, you know, people just hanging out, no minding in the middle of the Venezuelan jungle or something. And then along comes, you know, Juan Carlos Muc conquistador and <laughs> just wipes out his whole village while he's watching like, Oh, what? I'm being present watching everybody being killed. You know, it's like, there's, there's probably limits to the benefits of just being present and, uh, and not, making predictions and not, you know, not trying to, uh, to reason things around. So, so I guess the, one of the, the rationales for why we have self-talk at all, right. Is that it helps us to make sense of things that have already happened, right. Something happened and we're like, that was uncomfortable. How do I reconcile that with what I already know? And self-talk is one of the ways in which we can make sense of things like create meaning after the fact. And another one is trying to make sense of disparate kind of stimuli and signs coming in from the environment and so that we can try and make meaning find patterns and then predict the way that the world might be so that we can make decisions right so self-talk can be so leaving the present for the time being right and, and being like self-talk can help us make sense of the past self-talk can help us make sense of the potential future like does it have value there is there is there positive value to self-talk in doing those things well, I, I mean, I think there is tremendous positive value. I think the question isn't, is self-talk good or bad? I think the question is, who's the self? Which, mm. which self? Mm. So like when um, I, had, well, I was facing multiple attackers and every time you looked at me, you would say, drop your shoulders. Mm. So some part of me was telling me, here's the way to protect yourself against multiple attackers is to you know, raise yeah. your shoulders, turtle up, tense up, tight breathing, tunnel mm. vision <laughs> there's mm -hmm. three people behind me tunnel vision is going to help yeah. them all and the self that was doing that talk mm. was a of you know was suboptimal it was a pattern and i don't know when i developed the pattern of turtling mm -hmm. in that scenario mm. you know you could argue that that's an infantile pattern and that mm -hmm. the self that was doing that is an infant you know so if i if I think the, the issue is not the self-talk itself. Like that's a, we can work on that as part of it. But the question is, have, have, are we growing? Mm -hmm. So that the self that I am now is in concert with my environment. Is my neuroception appropriate? If I'm mm -hmm. scared all the time, if I'm always turtle, if I'm always breathing shallow and there's no th threat, then I'm, I'm in a mismatch. And I think mm -hmm. the issue is, is our self-talk matching the environment or mismatching is our self-talk creating 
an internal perception of the environment that's not even real. Yeah. So yes. I to myself, you know, ah, you're no good. Nobody cares about you. Nobody wants to work with you. Nobody loves you. Hmm. Then that's creating a reality for me. And that's like, you know, and if that's true, hmm. then, then I don't have a self-talk problem. Then I have a, I'm an asshole problem. Yeah. So there's an interesting thing in that. And if you, you know, if you look into the, like the cognitive neuroscience and, um, you start to get into this idea of like self-talk is obviously part of consciousness, right? It's a, it's, it's hard for us to know whether or not animals have self-talk, right? Whether or not my cats like regretting things and making, you know, like, ah, oh, I should have killed that bird sooner. Like, you know, or something like that all day long and just like ruining the day that it missed the chance at the squirrel or I, I don't know, whatever it's doing. Um, it's not clear that other animals do that a lot. It's possible that dolphins and chimps, are experiencing this all the time, like self-doubt and rumination and all that kind of stuff like that. We don't know, honestly, right? We don't have the experiments, I think, or the data yet to prove whether or not other animals have self-talk, but it's definitely part of that property that we call consciousness, right? It's definitely part of this awareness of self or, or illusion of self or whatever you want to call it, right? It's there. Um, it's part of that thing. But there's an argument in neuroscience, not all of it, not, not everybody makes this argument, but there's an argument that we don't need any of that. Like we don't need to be able to be conscious of ourselves to go through life, right? That we could probably do most of what we need to get done using what Kahneman might call the system one thing. Do you know what I mean? The system one aspect of thinking based just on intuition, based on past experience, um, based on just quick responses to things and, and them happening and not this slow kind of deliberative system too. And even if you accept that you need the slow deliberative system too, it's not clear that we need talk in order to do that. Right, the, the the patterns and the shapes that of thought, the kind of the mentalese that we're making, right? We're probably making those connections, making those decisions and figuring things out. And then we're translating those into English or you know, or Swahili or whatever language we speak, and then projecting that as self-talk into our brains after the fact that we've actually already come to conclusions, we've mm -hmm. already made decisions, and we're translating this after the fact. And it's not clear that it really serves a purpose beyond being like a a uh, you know an emergent property of the thought that's already happening right not everybody believes this i should say that now there's an argument i think about about that as well um so but you've, you've raised an interesting kind of idea that one of the antidotes so let's, so let's say you do have mental chatter right um if it's not harming you right if it's not creating that dissonance between you and the environment or you and other people things that are happening if it's happening and it's just kind of like a a theme a soundtrack that's running in your head and it's narrating the thing that you've already decided to do, then, then what's the problem, right? As, as long as what you're doing is, as long as that's kind of um, congruent with your actions and the decisions that you've made, that's fine. When self-talk becomes problematic, it's when you stop and pay more attention to that than you do the environment around you or the changing situation, right? So it's, it's an orientation problem in a sense, isn't it? It's like self-talk makes you stop observing the world around you and turn your consciousness just onto that talk and then be like, this is what's important, blah, 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 blah. And then you get into kind of this feedback loop in which you've stopped receiving information from the outside. And so you become misaligned with what's actually going on. Isn't that one of the dangers that the self-talk stops you from seeing the other person, stops you from seeing the whole situation. So in, in the case of the physical multiple attacker thing, right? Your self-talk like, oh God, this guy's gonna kill me. There's too many people. I, I just need to focus on the problem. You know, tunnel vision, looking at one guy while the other three guys could be thumping you in the back of the head, right? The problem there is that you're paying attention, too much attention to that and not enough attention to the whole environment. And so the, the solution to that, the antidote is to stop paying attention to the self-talk and push your consciousness to the outside and be like, okay, what's really happening, right? Not what do I think is happening, not how can I get out of this? What am I gonna predict? But what's really happening, right? And the same thing, isn't it? If you're in a kind of a, a loop of rumination based on fear or you're stuck, you're like, I can't do this. I'm never gonna pull this off. I'm a fraud, you know, whatever it is that you're know, going on in your head. One of the solutions to that that's preferred, I think in, in um, psychology is redirect your attention, right? Focus it on one thing outside of the body um, or change your perspective so that you're not overly focused on that talk. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I mean, I'm no expert, so. <laughs> okay, yeah. What was it saying in the book? What did uh, what what did she offer as a as a, as the he sorry as the um as the solutions? I, actually, to I don't it? know what these pronouns, so I'm, I was being presumptuous. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, the the main um, tool was distancing, 
So okay. it something like, you know, when you say your own name. Okay. Like, Howie, bring, pull yourself together is a form of distance. Or okay. say, Howie seems to be experiencing fear right now. Or yeah, yeah, that's the, that's third person, right? So yeah. that was second person, third person, um, things that we, we, you know, very, very cognitive, like, you know, how will 2040 Howie feel about this, you know, in, mm. in 20 years? How will, you know, um, how, what would you tell a friend? Mm. Right. So those, those are, so, I mean, all good as far as they go. And I actually recommend doing them. Yeah. You know, for me, the issue is you don't, you can't, you don't remember to do it when you're in the grip of this, of that negative self-talk. So you've yeah. got to return to the, to the breathing, to the neurology, to attentional practices that you make automatic. Yeah. Um, but like a couple of thoughts on what you said for, for First of all, I want to come back to this. So you you introduced me to two of my intellectual heroes, mm. uh, Barbara Tversky and Tyson Yunkaporta. Yeah, and both of them I feel like have something to say about this, and I mm. want to sort of put a, a pin in that and come back to it. Okay. Um, but it's like you know, Danny Kahneman um, talks about like I think he was asked if you could say one sentence to the world that everyone would listen to, like what's the most important thing you could tell people? And mm. he said something like whatever you're thinking about is not as important as you think it is when you're thinking about it. Mm, that's excellent. Yeah. So, so it's in, in terms of, you know, I'm coming back to that pickpocket, our self talk harms us when it becomes misdirection. Mm. When we're looking at it or looking th at, the, at the world through it. Yeah. As opposed to seeing what's important to us. Yeah. Okay. So the self talk is, um, becomes becomes a problem when it disorientates us right or misaligns us to what's actually going on yeah, yeah. okay cool yeah so what what were your thoughts and how is so I, I see the Tversky connection right away in that you know if we think in patterns and shapes right and we think in non-verbal kind of structures and and we're just looking and those mental movements are just reflective of physical movements and shapes and, and perspectives that we're actually mapping out in the world there, then where does this verbiage come in? Do you know, at what point does it enter? And, and from Tversky's work, it would suggest it's afterwards, right? <laughs> and so it's not necessarily useful. Yeah, so precisely that, uh, that we're, you know, we're, we're already oriented. Yeah. Um, and it's almost like self-talk becomes, becomes a form of self-doubt. Yeah. Am I, am I sure? Yeah. Right. Okay. Like, um, I'm I'm um, I'm playing masked ultimate frisbee uh, on Saturdays for a, on a team, and we're practicing. And and one of the things I'm starting to notice about myself is that there are patterns to the dumb shit I do on the field. Hmm. It's not like random. It's and it's like when the the time I will make a terrible throw is right after we had a turnover, and I pick it up and I see someone running deep, and I. And I get excited to throw it. And mm. if, if, like, there's a bunch of things going on there. One of which is be, after a turnover, I've just played defense. Mm. So <clears throat> I'm tired, I'm winded. Mm. So like, there's, you know, and the other is I see the person and first really, I should not be the person picking up the Frisbee. I'm not that good. That's, mm. that's not my play. And so I like, I'm, I'm noticing that the, I, what I need to do in that situation is engage in self-talk to block the, the bad self-talk, like to say, okay, this is one of those times, just run past it and let somebody else pick it up. Or if you're going to pick it up, take a deep breath, take your time, don't force it. Mm. So it's almost like I need remedial self-talk because I can't go from, okay, you got it. This is exciting. Yeah. Oh, to, to with, you know, to uh, withholding the action. Okay. So, so when you're doing that, is that, does that feel kind of a second person? Like you're having an argument with yourself? Is it like, are you going like, leave it, Howie, leave it. Don't pick it up, Howie. You know, yes. you're like that way. Or is it, yes. or is it kind of more third person? No, it's completely second person. Like, don't, okay. Yeah. Don't. Interesting. Yeah. So that could be, so that's, um, so, you know, a parallel for that one in Sistema might be that, you know, you're having trouble, like working, wrestling with somebody, doing free work, something like that. You're getting controlled. Things aren't going too well. And you just say to yourself, you're just like, just focus on breathing. Just focus on breathing, right? That's all you need to do. Or just enjoy the drill. Just play. Just play, right? Or something like that. Or structure, you know, just reminding yourself of one of those four pillars in order to kind of pull your body back into a state 
whether that matters more to you, like that becomes your focus more than the things that you've started thinking, right? But interestingly, I don't, I mean, I rarely experience what I would call self-talk in physical pursuits like you're talking about there, you know, in a game, in a competitive game, or in a, you know, in a martial arts tussle, you know, uh, as you're kind of sparring with somebody or wrestling with somebody. I really, um, and I've, you know, I try to pay attention to it. It's not that I'm not, I'm just ignoring my self-talk and there's words going on all the time. There just aren't words. There's just decisions being made and they're not always good ones. I'm not saying that. <laughs> it's not like perfect no mind and I'm, I'm exhibiting perfectly, you know, um, appropriate behaviors all the time. But when the behaviors come out, they they seem emergent from emotions um, without any recourse to cognitive reasoning at all. I don't I don't have to tell myself I just made a dumb decision and and ran away or went the wrong way or I'm being too aggressive. I just know that I am in a Tversky kind of sense, right? I understand the distance is wrong and the the shapes are wrong, and that's that's what I know. And there's not that's not really a problem for me. The, the only places where I experience negative self talk, and I, I see what you mean that you could in those situations, if your instincts and intuitions and your tendencies are driving you one way, then you might apply positive self-talk in the sense of like prefrontal cortex override to be like, bam, no limbic system. Don't be afraid. Straighten up, drop your shoulders, you know, really bludgeon it into <laughs> bludgeon the elephant, which is, a, you know, what I'd never tell anybody to do on this chest brief course. But I feel like doing that a lot might make you feel kind of additional tension. Do you know what I mean? Because it's like you're fighting with yourself when you're doing that, right? If, if you genuinely... Uh, and maybe you could do that as a crutch for a while to build a new habit, right? And then after a while, maybe you wouldn't have to tell yourself to do those things. So I feel like maybe it's useful in that context. But in terms of when the self-talk comes out and when I employ it, it's really during those times, it's normally during like a, a cognitive conflict, you know, like the, there's something that I don't feel resourced to deal with. And the problem seems to be ballooning beyond my ability to contain it, right? That's usually when the self-talk that I notice at least comes up and then I start ruminating on things and I sit there and I realize I've been sitting there for like 10 or 15 minutes and I haven't done anything about the problem. I haven't written anything down. I haven't got, I haven't come to any new insights and nor am I, you know, I'm not doing that thing where I'm letting the dust settle and I'm, I'm becoming bored and letting everything settle out. I'm not doing that at all. It's just activity, useless, surplus, shaking the snow crap globe. activity. Sorry. Just shaking the snow globe. Yeah, so, yeah, nice, great. It helps that my head looks like a snow globe, but like, apart from that, yeah, absolutely, yeah, great analogy. It is like shaking the snow and nothing will settle and no good decisions come. So that's the place where I feel self-talk is, you know, when we get into this, this is the place where it needs to be recognized and redirected the most, I think, when we get trapped in long patterns of indecision, not quick patterns of decisions, because I feel like those are usually taken care of by system one anyway, right? Um, and so it's these long patterns and deliberations. That's where we have the most power to intervene, I think, with self-talk. And you identify, so the book says one, one way is get some distance, right? So again, take yourself out of the equation, stop having a conversation with yourself, think about something else, or just tell yourself one thing and then bam, you're gone kind of that way. Um, another one surely though, is just kind of doing something if, if, if that's happening doing something that changes the need for the self-talk right so if you feel like you don't have enough experience or knowledge to go into a meeting and talk to somebody or to coach somebody on something right no amount of self-talk saying like no i am good i'm really good i'm the best coach i have all the knowledge i need i'll be fine will make you feel any better about it when you walk into the room and see the person kind of scowling at you and you have to be but actually getting some normal knowledge and being like what do i actually need to know right? Let me do my homework on this person. What do they need? What can I give them? Do I have sufficient knowledge and skills in order to do that? Great. Yeah. Then let's go into the room and then we do it. It's the same thing with a test. Instead of stressing about all the things that might be on the test, you ask yourself, and I saw this a lot at university, my university is, I used to see people who would constantly do practice papers and look at like past exams and try and anticipate what's going to be on the test and all that kind of stuff, right? And I just made it my business to learn the material that the instructors, the professors taught, as thoroughly as I could. I'm like, what are the principles they're trying to get across? What do I absolutely need to understand and know? And I would read around things in the book in order to make sense to it to myself. And then I'll go into the exam safe in the knowledge that they can't test me on anything that wasn't within those principles. Like they can't test me on anything that wasn't in the course. They can't play a trick on you and test you on something that you might have read outside the course. So, and I did great. You know, I came top of my year. I was like the equivalent of valedictorian in genetics and all that kind of stuff. And all I did was just learn the principles and, and, and other people tried to outsmart that. Do you know what I mean? And it didn't work out and they got very tense and they hated exam time. But I walked into the exam being like, 
nothing more I can do at this point. Now I'm just me, right? That kind of way. And I feel like that's isn't making sure that your needs are met, your kind of cognitive needs, or just knowing that you have the resources to deal with something, an antidote to self-talk emerging in the first place. Yeah. So, I mean, what comes up for me there is like, what was the self-talk difference that led you and those other people to approach it differently? Or what, you know, what were the beliefs that you told yourself? So that, mm. you know, I could see someone saying, gee, I'm, I'm probably not smart enough to know the material. Look at all these other people. They've asked better questions in class. It, mm. Everybody understands this except me. I better find some hack. I better parrot fashion so I can just regurgitate some words and phrases and still scrape a grade or something. Right. I mean, there's, you know, so in your approach, I sense a great confidence in your own competence. Like, mm. I can learn this. It'll take time. It won't be easy. Yeah. Um, there's, you know, I don't need shortcuts. I'm going to, mm. my goal is to understand this material really, really well. Yeah. And, you know, and so what the question, like, I think the, the real issue with the self-talk that he's trying to deal with in the book is when we self-talk in ways that self-sabotage, hmm. you know, and, and, and positive self-talk can self-sabotage just as much, right? Like, yes, I can do this operation. I watched a YouTube, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, like we, it's more important to be accurate than positive. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good, it's more important to be accurate than positive. Yeah, that, that's, I think that's really good. I'm just trying to think like parallels in my worlds of stress coaching and then like martial arts coaching, right? Teaching people in system and things like that, right? Um, and in stress, you're right. I think that some people come to, and this is one of the things I talk about early on in the courses that I do, is that people tend to come to stress with one of a couple of mindsets, right? One of them is like stress is caused by external things right? People make me stress or situations or jobs, or this guy always makes me stressed that it's a stimulus response. Like it automatically creates this thing. There's not nothing I can do about it. Um, and there's not a lot of control. There's not many levers that you can pull to mediate your response. So the way that you control stress is either you just take it like, just weather it, you know, and go through things or you avoid the stimulus, right? You do everything that you can not to be triggered that way. Right. And then you talk to everybody about what your triggers are. You make sure nobody ever upsets you ever. Um, and then that's how you deal with stress essentially. Right. Or if it, and if it does happen, then you just blame the other person for triggering you right all the time. Um, all the situations, it's not always a person, right. It might be a job or a place or whatever it's going to be. Um, and the other sort of person, the other kind of belief that you can have about it is that it, it's um, stress is, it's a process, right? It, it comes inside of me. I'm part of building stress, right? I created it partly inside my body. There's outside ingredients to that, but I'm part of the thing that creates it, right? Um, and that I have some leverage. I have some kind of um, agency over what can be done about it, right? Um, and that it's not inevitable, right? and it's not always terrible. It doesn't always beat you down and make you make dumb decisions. Sometimes you can use that get fired up and it kind of gets transformed into a challenge and then you do some of your best work right or something like that so people coming in with one of those two mindsets the challenge people um sometimes they're overconfident right they spent many many years thinking that they're kind of just stress bunnies and they're riding on it and that they're fine and that they do great with it right um and sometimes they're not doing as great as they think. Sometimes they have really high blood pressure and they're, they're suffering with it in an allostatic way under the hood, right? While they're doing this thing that they think they're challenging with. And of course, the people who think they're suffering are suffering, right? That's <laughs> the people who, who are, are convinced that they're just being battered and waylaid by stress all the time. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. They always will, right? So there's always that point at the beginning where I have to try and get everybody on the same you know, Peter Bregman, big arrow, right? Everybody has to be aligned in the in the same direction about what we're trying to do here. We're like, stress can be shitty. Stress can also be positive. The mindset can be important, but let's just acknowledge what it is. It is a process and it can do one of these two things and it can do any of these two things to anybody. And I feel like some people accept that and some people sit within their little silos. Some people are like, yeah, maybe some people can, but I'm different. Or like my stress, my situation, my job, is so unique that you don't understand why I couldn't do this, right? And that's an extraordinarily difficult thing to overcome, I think, when people come in with that negative, um, I don't know, it's self-talk, I don't know if they tell themselves that all the time, but it's definitely like a lack of self-belief, um, which has to be overcome before you can start the process. Well, here's where I have my biggest problem with the self-talk world is specifically around this idea of stress, hmm. which, which is to say, the thought is, okay, so, you know, Kelly McGonigal's work, uh, the upside, the upside of stress, of stress. Hmm. 
that, okay, so, so the problem with stress isn't the stress, it's my mindset. Mm. And if I just, and so that becomes another cudgel to beat people. Yeah. Why can't you just transform it? Just change your mind and then you'll get stronger. You know? Yeah. That's not or another yeah. cudgel that you hand people, then they can beat themselves with. Yeah. Like, well, you know, so, oh, so now what I need to do is say, how is this for, you know, how is this for me instead of done, being done to me? Mm. And again, I think it's, it's a very weak place to intervene. It's like trying to intervene at the level of let's grow profits as yeah. opposed to let's, let's do different things with mm. a different level of sophistication and intensity. So, so what's the opposite of that? It's, it's, it's genuinely experiencing what's actually going on, feeling it in your body and then starting from that place. I, I give almost everybody I coach now. And I, you know, I got this from you and from your recommendation of um, your stress response is killing you by, mm -hmm. uh, by Mark Schoen. Yeah. Um, I will have people practice three times a day for two to three minutes at a time, relaxing breath, out mm -hmm. breath, longer than in breath. Yeah. That's all they do for the week because mm. I just want it to get into their muscle memory. Mm. Then week two, I have them do that, but I ask them to, I'll take them through an exercise on a, on a scale of one to 10, where one is you're totally relaxed and 10 is the worst thing you can imagine. Mm. Pick, think of a thought that brings you to a two or three. Mm. Feel it in your body, feel the stress response, and then it commence the breathing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then practice that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, awesome. in Sistema, we do the same thing, but we stress our bodies on purpose, right? And you know, we'll stand in a push-up position for five minutes or do a bunch of push-ups holding your breath in order to create that physiological stress, really feel it, not just imagine it, you know, and, and then we recover from that on purpose. And that's the corollary to psychological stress for us. But yeah, same idea, right? So a little bit of stress. That's, that's where I learned it, except I just, you know, I can't hit people or I'm <laughs> in a position to do, you know. I can't now either. It's terrible. I have to talk to them via Zoom and stuff. It's so difficult. But anyway. <laughs> Yeah, maybe we'll get haptic feedback at some point and we can, you know, do the STEM lessons where you can just, you know, punch them with a, a virtual glove or something. Maybe that will happen. <laughs> Who knows? But yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about, so there's, um, so as the corollary with systemic training for people training martial arts, one phenomenon that I see is that, okay, um, if you come in with the idea that this is a very holistic system of self-defense and self-protection, right? If you, if you come in bought into the idea that this is going to help you and that if you just, study the principles and you study the fundamentals then it's going to help you to create the attributes that will make you stronger safer braver right it will it will increase in a kind of very probabilistic way your chances of survival right but for some people that's not enough for some people just training steadily to to increase these attributes and over time have that make your chances better are not enough and they kind of want to again like the exam people doing the test subjects or trying to anticipate what's going to happen they just want the specific hacks they're like okay yeah, but what if somebody grabs me around the waist or what if somebody tries to choke me or what if somebody's just a really good boxer and they're jabbing at me and i need the techniques i need the things so that i can get past this forget about the fear and forget about my structure and all that crap you know like we'll, we'll get to that maybe we'll come back around to breathing and stuff once i learn how to punch people in the face right there's, there's this kind of you but they want to sidestep things and there's a kernel of truth in the in the idea that yeah you do need to understand the physical movements and the distance and the potential of attacks in order to deal with them and you do need to have people do them to you in order for you to understand that experience but you can't wait to deal with the 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 response that you're having right you, you have to deal with that first because that's going to dictate everything about how you apply what you learn right if you're if you're fundamentally terrified of being punched in the face no amount of practicing hitting a bag or hitting mitts is actually going to help you to avoid that and then hit the other person first because he'll be more comfortable with getting hit in the face than you will and that's it right um and if somebody's, if you're terrified of being on the ground and being squashed and being compressed and not being able to breathe then no amount of jujitsu training um, of knowing techniques and watching them on YouTube or even drilling them again and again with somebody without somebody really trying to squash you or something is going to make you feel better about it. You, you'll just hate the fact that you're losing and being constricted when you're in that tussle. Um, and that will be the predominant thing. You'll be like, oh, I'm no good. I'm losing. This guy's too good for me. And then, and then it's gone. So for me, the, the antidote to that is just come back to principles again and again and again, right? Just work those fundamentals and make your goal just to improve those fundamentals while you're playing with other things and not to focus too much on, on the end point. Or like, did I escape? Did I get the guy down? Did I do these things? Right. And just to put kind of faith for the want of a better word 
in the in the system that you're employing like find find a series of principles that you believe in and then keep going with those and in that you can convince yourself at least or convince your limbic system that you're safe enough for now right you're in this playful environment and people nobody's really trying to kill you in here right this is a place where you can afford to experiment and once you do that then you can layer on the skills and you can do things but if you approach every single training interaction as if it's potentially life or death you're like there is no play there is no exploration it's just everything must be pressure tested right away and everything has to be death or not like right away then you're never going to you're never really going to fully experience what it is that's going on on the inside and the, and the decisions that are being made there before you come out right so maybe self talk has a has a place in that in that you can when you're in the midst of one of those responses, you can say to yourself, no, this is not about me beating this guy. This is not about me winning. This is not about me doing any of those things. The goal of this is play and expanding my repertoire. Or the goal of this is to watch myself and watch what I do and see where, where the tension comes, what the emotions are and that kind of stuff. And just to tell yourself that's the goal, even under pressure when your, your brain might not be wanting to do that. Is, is there kind of a, a similar kind of thing for people in the grip of difficult decision-making or urgent kind of, you know, for someone who need to, to grow their career, they need to be able to speak up more in meetings. And they're mm. terrified of speaking up in meetings because they are having their, their self-talk tells them that they're going to get punched in the face and they can't handle it. Whatever, yeah. you know, the equivalent of that, they can't even say what's going to happen. Or mm. if you ask them cognitively, yes, I know it's silly. Mm. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to tangent on that for a second. And, um, tell you about um so i'm i'm a, a woodworker which okay. you don't know about me because the only thing i've ever made is a uh, paper towel rack uh, but but after making it i was so impressed with myself that i wanted to go buy a table saw mm. um, and i talked to some friends who were woodworkers and they begged me not to buy a table saw because they thought i would kill myself with it because yeah it's the most dangerous piece of equipment uh, in most shops Mm. And so then I looked up this company called Stop uh, Saw Stop. Do you know about them? Nope, can't say that. Dude. You, you got to look them up. They they make a table saw that has um, there's a current, an electrical current running through the blade that then goes into um, something you know the the axle of the blade and then goes into a cartridge um, with some sort of pressurized air. And if anything organic. Mm your finger touches the blade, it stops instantly. So I was okay. watching videos of people like the blade is going 4,000 RPM. They touch it with their finger and they have barely a scratch. Wow. And they, how does it stop that quickly? You would think the momentum would yeah. keep it going long enough to still take something up. Yeah, you gotta want, and people do, you know, video videos with like hot dogs mm. and like pushing it slowly, like, you know, like literally like throwing the hot dog at the thing. And there's like a gash, like a, an eighth of an inch. Like, you know, yeah, you'd maybe need stitches, but, you know, you'd have your finger. Mm. And, and my thought experiment was if I got that. And by the way, when you when you do that, when you stop it, you have to replace the cartridge and the blade. So it's expensive, you know, mm. like 100 bucks every time. But mm. like, you know, I'd argue that that's worth a finger. <laughs> um, if I was my thought experiment was suppose somebody gave me 50 hot dogs. And I could do it and do it and do it and do it and feel like completely confident that the thing would stop. Would I be able to do it with my finger? And I mm. think the answer is no. Mm. Like that would be a leap that I would that my body would not be willing to make. And so the, the question I have is for like, how do we as coaches, as martial arts instructor, yeah. um, get people to like a form of exposure therapy to get them to what feels like a quantum leap to when I might, I might face you and you might punch me in the face. Mm. How, you know, how do we, and, and what, what the word that really struck with me with what you just said was play. Like yeah. exposure therapy must, I think must be combined with this ethos of play, of curiosity, yeah. of, of growth, of optimism, of delight, something positive in there, as opposed to, all right. Like I remember the first time I got hit in the face, it wasn't by you, it was by Nien. Mm. And he hit me harder than I thought he would. You know, yeah. <laughs> he doesn't mess around. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I felt like crying, like sitting down, like quitting Sistema, like for the first four minutes after he hit me in the face. Yeah. I was like, this is 
this is all wrong. Hmm. And it's kind of, that's kind of what I needed yeah. to get past it. But it could have gone a little bit worse. Like if, if it had been, oh, yeah. you could been have... place, I might have quit. Yeah, you might have left. And I think the answer to that is that play doesn't just feature feelings of positivity, right? Because it's hard to conjure feelings of positivity if, if you don't have them. I don't know how I'd feel positive about putting my hand towards a saw, whether or not I thought it was going to like not cut my finger off. But I mean, in the saw example, but the, the other characteristic of play is that it has rules. Right. You can afford to play because you've both agreed within a limited set of boundaries of what you're going to do. Right. When you play soccer, nobody's allowed to touch the ball with their hands. You can't just pick it up in the middle of the thing and cheat and do it that way. Right. Then when you play, um, you know, play American football, you're not supposed to at least punch people in the face. Right. <laughs> or to trip them up in that way that you have established ways of tackling and working with people and stuff like that. And even when you're doing a martial art, you know, every martial art has its rules, even something like MMA, which seems totally brutal and completely freestyle to the, the layman has has tons and tons of rules that have been gradually put in over the years, like no eye gouging and no kicking people in the head when they're already on the floor and things like that, you know, which protect the people um, and allow you to play at a different level. Now, the level of play in, in MMA is extraordinarily, um, it, it's towards the dangerous end of the scale, right? Um, like that way, the level of play in Ultimate Frisbee is different, right? <laughs> it's, but the rules give you the confidence to be able to play within those boundaries. If you, if you don't know the rules are there, if you think that there's the capacity for somebody to break the rules or something, all hell to break loose, right? Then you don't feel confident enough to feel the positive emotions that go along with play and the challenge and the flow and everything that comes with it. So it, the answer to that is attenuation, right? The reason why it could have gone either way with you and getting punched in the face by Nguyen is, is that you went from something you had no experience of and all the fear of to experiencing it. And then that could have gone one way or the other. You could have been like, bang, 10 minutes. So I feel like crying. Wow. Now maybe I need this. Maybe I need to experience this and come back. Or you could have gone like, bam, this was terrible. The instructor really should be more careful about letting people get punched in the face. This is just dis demoralizing, dispiriting. I don't need these people. I'm not safe here. And you leave and then you go somewhere else, right? Either one of those things could have happened, right? Um, but if during the same class, you wore up to it by somebody pressing your face, right? And then somebody pushing your face over and over again, and then pushing your face quite hard. So it's irritated, right? And then hitting lightly and then working up to a, quite a hard hit. It's like the frog in the boiling water myth, even though it doesn't, it's not actually true. Um, you would probably be fine. Then you'd stay in the water while you're getting punched in the head after you've done all of those buildups. But I'm not sure what the analogy would be for the saw. It would probably be off the top of my head, having them demonstrate right? With a saw blade that has a blunted edge. It's not like it doesn't have a cutting edge on it, but it spins at the same speed. And then you put your finger on that and you watch it stop. Right. And then you would go to one, which is like mostly sharpened, but hasn't had the perfect diamond edge on or, it to do that. Or a glove. Yeah, maybe a glove, but again, the glove would give, yeah. I mean, the glove might give you a full sense of like, I have to have a glove on for this to be safe or something. But do you know what I mean? If you could do it with a blunt spinning blade and they showed the proof of concept, presumably you don't have to have a sharp edge for the electricity to be sensed and the current to be. So proof of concept, then if you did that a hundred times instead of hot dogs, and then you did it once, you'd probably still be a little like, oh, here's the sharp one, but you'd done it a hundred times. You had that memory, you had that association, you did it once. Then every time after that, you'd be like, oh, this is something that happens. And presumably the same thing is true with skydiving. You know, <laughs> the first time you do it, you have to be, I've not skydived, right? So, but um, but the first time you, there has to be a voice in the back of your head, like, yeah, what if the guy didn't pack it right? What if this thing comes off? I've seen on the news, there's always some beginning skydiver, you know, it's one in every million or something, but that could be me today. You know, like maybe he has a heart attack on my back and doesn't pull the thing or I've, I pull it at the wrong time or the whole shoot comes off and I'm just hanging a bag, right? That has to be going through your head the first time and maybe the second time a little bit. The 50th time? Probably not. And that's because of experience. It's not because you you had positive self-talk on the way down. Like, this is totally going to work. I completely trust this. I've looked at the stats, right? It's <laughs> Well, don't be silly. There's no reason to be afraid. Of course, there's a reason to be afraid. You just jumped out of a bloody aeroplane. What do you think is going to happen? You know, you're jumping into a map. You're going to die unless this thing actually opens. It's a perfectly rational fear and you can't reason your way out of it, right? Um, the, the antidote to that is experience you've done it enough times that you trust the equipment and you trust the process and i think that's probably true of most of these things but then comes the conundrum how do you get experience if it's something scary enough that it's hard to progress to and i think that comes down to creativity like how if you're afraid of speaking speaking up and in front of groups of hostile people in business meetings where else can you practice speaking can you do like a an improv class can you like try 
stand up comedy with your family do you know what i mean or something like that you know what's what's a little bit less scary than that and then get a bunch of experience of those and then have a crack at the meeting you know right it's, it, you you have to be a scientist yeah a little bit you have to be like oh i don't know if this is going to be okay i don't know if i'm going to survive but i'm willing to take this risk because of the attenuation and the rules we put in place yeah exactly yeah and i think okay. as as a coach i think that's the hardest most valuable thing I can do is to help my clients create the hypotheses that they're going to go out and test. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and I think that's where the most valuable work is, you know, and, and also it's not the same for everybody, right? You can't have a one size fits all. Like this is how you inoculate people against stress. This is how you change people's relationship with food. This is how you stop people being afraid of being hit with a stick, right? There's principles, there's things that will probably work better and there's stepping stones that you could use that other people have used, but you have to look at the individual in front of you and say, why would this person be more terrified of speaking than the average person? Or why does this person seem you know, abnormally terrified of doing this thing and talking to them, listening, doing enough of that active listening and empathy that you actually get a full picture for where this, these things might be coming from. And then you can tailor your stepping stones and your training progressions or coaching progressions, right? Um, and you can either take it slower with them or you can introduce additional steps or you could just, you know, acknowledge that they're individual as well. And there might be some individual work to be done here that's not just part of the one-to-many approach. Right. And, you know, what I'm realizing one, one of the, I don't know if we've talked about the never binge again stuff. Um, a little bit, not on the podcast, but yeah, you've, you've talked Glenn, about that. Mm. Glenn, Glenn Livingston has a system where, you know, for people to lose weight, to, to get control over their eating, he has them name the voice in their head that wants them to break their rules. So, you know, so like, let's create the rules. Okay, I don't eat after 7 p.m. I don't eat processed sugar, whatever it is. And then when that moment comes up, you're going to hear the voice, which he originally called the pig. Uh, then he became an ethical vegan and he doesn't like it so much anymore. But the, <laughs> now he calls it Alan instead of <laughs> just, just Dave. It's a random name. Alan! <laughs> um, that you then listen to that voice, not, you know, at first maybe you're going to debate it. Like, oh, is it, you know, is it saying something true? Yes, I deserve this now. Oh, is that true? No, I deserve to be healthy, right? Or, mm. oh, there's that voice again. I'm just going to ignore it or I'm going to tell it to shut the fuck up or mm. or I'm going to become mindful and let that voice. OK, that voice is just like when I go get my car um, serviced and they're playing, you know, talk radio and, I, and I'm waiting and you know, I'm listening to talk radio. It doesn't mean I've suddenly become, um, you know, a, a Rush Limbaugh fan. Yeah, right. I can hear things without believing them, even if it's self-talk. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I'm reminded just to uh, close things back out again of a, a systemic instructor many, many years ago. It was based in Charlotte, who um, we were just doing that basic hold a long push up thing. And I think we went for like a 10 minute one. It was a fairly hefty, you know, stand in the top of the push up position and just hang out for 10 minutes. And the instruction at the beginning of it, people do that in different ways. They're like, you know, move the tension around, listen to your body. If something starts to get locked and twist it around. And I, I find that doesn't always help. Like sometimes you'll fidget your way into collapse doing that, right? Um, in that exercise. But you had a really interesting instruction, which is you're going to start this exercise. You'll be fine for 30 seconds or a minute. After that, there'll be a little voice in your head that tells you if you just move a little bit, if you just put yourself in a slightly different position, you'll be more comfortable. That voice is a liar, right? <laughs> and it's just like, no matter how many times it tells you that, it's not true. That actually the easiest position to stay in, the most stable one, is the one that you've started in. You will put yourself naturally in a comfortable position where all the weight is distributed really, really well. And that's a good structural position. If you're shifting from that, you'll only get temporary relief. And then when you come back again, it will feel worse and it'll feel worse. So just don't listen to it or just, you know, shout it down, argue with it, be like, no, no, liar, liar, liar. And just commit to, to your purpose, which is staying exactly in this position, not fidgeting around and staying there for 10 minutes. And if you don't do that, if you commit to that principle and your elbows give out and you're sweating and you collapse on the floor, you did a great job, right? You did it to the end of your capacity. But if you fidget, you'll never know how far you can go before you do that. And I think there's, that's something to take home. Like sometimes it's worth, um, tackling the self-talk just to see how far you can go without it, you know? Uh -huh. So let me see if I can bring that around to what I wanted to talk about earlier, which is Tyson. Okay. Tyson Young Caporta. And so what happened there was that you had an interaction with another person. They got into your self-talk. And what I hear Tyson saying is the problem with self-talk is not the talk, it's the self. 
mm-hmm. we are, that, you know, we are. You think you're better or worse than anybody else? Than you? We're uh, certainly separate. Yeah. That, that my me as an atom, I'm almost certainly insane. Mm. Right. Which is to say, my views are not in concert with the world as it is. Yeah. Like, you know, I'm I'm certain of that. Mm. But as a collective, we have a certain resilience. Mm to that, that, I, that if, you're, if you're a little bit insane and I'm a little bit insane and Heather's a little bit insane and Mia's a little bit insane, when we come together, we can kind of balance each other out. Kind of crowdsource the sanity and reality. But, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that the, when that, you know, whether you're really alone, like so many of us have been over this pandemic, or whether you're part of an organization and you're just a bunch of individualistic strivers, Hmm. I think there's there's something that we lose by not being more indigenous, by not being more connected with each other, with nature, with the world. That hmm. also, um, you know, if we are nature and we're disconnected from nature, we have to be disconnected with ourselves, which means we have to be talking to ourselves as if we're completely different people. Excellent point, man. Yeah, definitely. So it's that that faith and identification with the with the bigger purpose the higher power and the and the bigger meaning the the bigger reality and and not the uh you know there's so much salience on on what you yourself believe because it's probably not true in, in the whole <laughs> and there's probably more truth in the aggregate but also speaks to the importance of choosing your friends carefully because otherwise they'll just amplify your insanity <laughs> so right, well enter the internet right <laughs> yeah definitely another reason to get off facebook tomorrow <laughs> okay <laughs> Well, I think that brings us full circle. So that, that was really interesting. No, I went to some cool places as usual. So thanks very much for taking the time. Thank you. I think I got some new, um, some new things to try in my coaching. So thank you. Well, let me know how it goes. All right. See you soon. Hope.